Hello everybody, this is Pascal from Neutrality Studies and today I have the best news in the world. You know how I told you all a couple of days ago that Glenn Deason was banned from YouTube? He's back! Glenn Deason is back and he's not just back here, he's back on YouTube. The YouTube reinstated his channel and I guess I don't have to introduce him, right? Glenn Deason is a professor at the University of Southeast Norway an academic colleague, somebody I've met in 2019 when we were together at a conference in Washington, and somebody whose analysis on Russia and Ukraine and the European international relations uh, environment is just hugely important. And all of his books, uh, he has nine or 10 or 11 books, um, and they are all important ones in, in this field. So uh, Glenn, I'm so happy that you're announcing your return to YouTube here on Neutrality Studies. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, we were uh, supposed to have a different topic, but then I got this uh, email uh, this morning, an hour ago. Um, yeah, about uh, the reversal of this of the decision, which is uh, yeah, which is interesting, but uh, it also came as a bit surprised because uh, you only get on YouTube one one chance to do one repeal, and I did that repeal, and I got an automated response that they rejected it. So uh the ban was supposed to be permanent so it's um the yeah the reversal of this uh, for me is a very positive <laughs> development obviously because these digital platforms are very important tools for academics especially to you know communicate with other academics such as yourself but also to communicate uh the, the research and the academic discussion and the findings to a wider audience that is it's also supposed to not to yeah to um, commit the to further uh, yeah, communicate the yeah. findings to wider society. So to to remove this digital uh, uh, public square, if you will, it's uh, it's quite uh, dramatic. So I'm uh, I'm yeah I'm quite happy that it's this very, was reversed. Uh, absolutely, and you you just told me before we started the show because I thought we will talk about what happened to you and and what happened with this ban, you know, in order to alert everybody to what's going on. But now it turns out. They reinstall, uh, they put you back on, and you know it's very dystopian. Everybody, the the way YouTube communicates with us is all through automated emails, and then you have maybe a little blue button, say a p to say appeal to some decisions or whatnot. But it's all a machine, and you're made to understand that it's a machine, and it's cocooned in this pretty language. It's like we want to be a responsible platform, and we keep you safe, and and the health of the of the environment. Um, can you maybe start with uh, how this ban happened to you? How, what was your experience of it first? And then we go into how it was reversed. Uh, well, it's, uh, it's uh, I, I was um, I actually got some calls from uh, other people as well, because over the past few weeks, I, I had a heads up that they began to uh, ban many accounts. So I've heard, I, I know several uh, YouTubers who were removed and uh, so I, I kind of I knew that it was coming. So I was already transferring material onto other platforms. But but the way uh, they approached it was simply uh, I had an email come into my account saying oh, we have a our um, you know combination of our artificial intelligence the automation and uh, uh, people have uh, detected hate speech. And uh, of course, it's a generic email they send uh, to anyone they ban. And uh, so we have deleted your account. So I had no warnings. Uh, there was no reference to what the hate speech was or, you know, indeed who, who I hate because I didn't know I hated anyone. And um, and uh, yeah, of, of course, no evidence. So it, and then so you sit there going, well, what hate speech? And they deleted you. So uh, so you're gone. And then uh, you can't really do much. There's one button you can press to put in an appeal and uh, I just wrote, you know, certainly this is a mistake. I'm a, I'm an academic. We, uh, this is a, uh, you know, there can't be, there can't be anything hate, hate there, hateful. I, I would doubt there's even anything offensive comments or anything derogatory I said about any groups. I mean, this, uh, I'm not sure. Again, which group this would be, who I would hate. So it's it's very strange. But then, anyways, when I submitted this, uh, you know, a few hours later, you get another another automated reply, which is uh, yes, we reviewed and uh, you're still banned. So <laughs> this is permanent. So it's uh, yeah, it it is a bit dystopian, and because exactly as I said, because it's all automated, you don't actually get to present your case. You don't get to talk to a human being. I mean, you can, you know, this it feels like this button to 
um, uh, to appeal it's a little bit you know you can go down in your own basement and scream you have this right but it doesn't do anything so it is um yeah it's, it's unfortunate and and the ban was permanent they told you and now they reinstated you an hour ago what happened i don't know i there's some uh different uh, uh well for for me it's uh uh I'm, I'm not quite sure i i did contact the uh the, the the google uh media department because i you know i'm actually writing a book so i'm already in contact there um I, i'm writing a book on uh, on on tech and censorship actually and the uh, narrative control so i've written books about this previously well touched on the topic i wrote books like uh, yeah the great power politics and the fourth industrial revolution I looked at Russophobia and international propaganda. I looked at think tank rackets. So this is uh, one of the books I'm currently working on. And um, so I've, I've asked for an interview to discuss, but also then I brought up my case, given that this is uh, an interview I'm trying to get with them, because there's a lot of evidence now from uh, from uh, from from the United States in which the U.S. House of Representatives uh, Judi Judiciary Committee has actually reported uh, um, you know, evidence that the, the White House courses big tech uh, to to do this, and then and then you know people like Mark Zuckerberg confirming this. So there's already a lot of evidence. So I wanted to pursue an interview simply based on the you know the existing facts. Uh, so I'm not sure if that helped. <laughs> Otherwise, uh, I, yeah, yesterday I had an interview, I, or I, I was interviewed by Professor Jeffrey Sachs. He has a digital book club. So he was interviewing me about my uh, last book, which was yeah, 11th, by the way, on uh, uh, yeah, the, the Ukraine war and the, and the Eurasian world order. So we're discussing this book for like an hour. And towards the end of the interview, he, he you know, mentions the brings up the, the YouTube uh, censorship and uh, and, um, you know, he's I've interviewed him before. He's he watches our podcast, so he knew you know, he knows I don't, you know, spread hate about any group. So he, he said pretty much, yeah, on, <laughs> on during the interview as well that you know he would look into this, uh, see see what I could do. And uh, again, I'm not sure why they reversed it, uh, but uh, anyways, the next day <laughs> I was uh, back back uh, on on YouTube. So it's very strange, and uh, the whole thing feels very arbitrary. The, there is no, um, you know, if. If you're at an institution, you have people around you, you can talk. Like I'm, I'm used to getting criticism from, a, you know, a NGO in Norway financed by the U.S. State Department and the National Endowment for Democracy, who tends to, you know, do this kind of, um, well, who was set up by Reagan explicitly to manipulate manipulate civil society in other countries. I'm used to getting complaints, but then if I get complaints, I can put forward my case to actual, you know, human beings. I can explain hey, this is, you know why what they're saying is nonsense and I, I can have my not my day in court but I can have myself heard uh, so I can defend myself but on this uh, automated platforms it's uh, yeah it's very arbitrary it's uh, yeah this as you said and you know other platforms managed to do that too at rumble I had already two or three times people I could talk to and be in exchange with I mean it's and rumble is much smaller and has much less money and they manage to have like human interactions with uh, with creators. YouTube it just makes a living out of not doing that and stonewalling you. And one more thing, you know, YouTube has a process actually, right? In order to alert creators that there's a problem with their content. And that's the strike system. First, second, third strike. That's what we were all thinking. That's the rules we are under that if we produce something that's in violation with YouTube's uh, rules and regulation, the video gets a strike. And then you get alerted that, by the way, don't do that. And then you get a second strike, and then you cannot post anymore. And when you get the third strike, that's when the channel is gone. We all thought yeah. that's the case. And now it turns out, oh, no, they have a separate uh, uh, they have a separate way where they just, like, without any strikes or anything, they just delete Africa Stream. They just delete DD Geopolitics, just delete you and uh, um, um, Miss Blavis. Um, can you explain yeah, this? I received, <laughs> I received the email from uh, Rachel Blevins as well. You know, she's, uh, you know, <laughs> uh, yeah, lovely, uh, you know, soft-spoken. There's not a, you know... A, not no hate coming from her but uh, she sent me an email because she got banned uh, a few hours uh, away from me so it was uh, there seems to be um, 
effort but uh, i also yeah received an uh, email uh, from uh, from uh, yeah another acquaintance um, uh, colonel uh, lawrence wilkerson he was chief of staff under colin powell in the under the bush administration and uh, yeah he also pointed out that uh, they took down judge napolitano uh, took down his account but they had to reverse it because you know for god's sake he's a judge so <laughs> He threatened to sue apparently so i'm not sure exactly what happened but he was down for a week apparently and then he came back uh at least this is what i'm being told so i, I thought it... he had a strike i thought he had one strike and then they 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 take away your capacity to upload in that oh. one week i think yeah, I'm. I'm not sure. This is uh, from Colonel Wilkerson. I heard, but but anyway. So uh, more more to your question. Uh, uh, they why I didn't get strikes? Why they just uh, deleted it uh, immediately? Was in the in me email. It wasn't just hate speech. They said severe and repeated hate speech. So because it was apparently so profound, they had to take down the whole account at once without any warnings. But uh, they went. It went from you know severe. And repeated hate speech to oh yeah there's nothing there so, <laughs> but again it you know i would like to think there's not a purge and there's a just a, a, it is it's, a, it's an accident but uh, but if it, if it was a mistake it also begs the question like what are the weaknesses with all of this automation i know the automation is in its you know early young faces uh, you know you can always argue mistakes are made um, on the other hand, there is a lot of accounts which have been taken down lately. So either they changed the algorithm and it just went uh, off the rails, or there is some select uh, selective ones. Because if surely if you create if you are if you are cheering on the bombing of Palestinians or you're celebrating the killing of Russians, uh, I've never heard any of those accounts being taken down. So if the hate goes one way, it seems okay. But if you offer criticism without hate going the other way you could be cancelled so it does seem if it's just algorithms it nonetheless seems like those algorithm algorithms have been are pushing in one very specific direction because the I, war the those opposing war they're all getting taken down while the people have been cheering on the war in the middle east bomb iran bomb russia you know they, they're they're not going anywhere they, they they seem very safe where they're sitting so you no, know, it's I, I also I belong to the people who cautions others from like drawing too many connections where there's probably a, a simpler explanation. I mean, one colleague on YouTube, he told me, oh, my my videos, they get a lot of views in the beginning and then they flatline. This is a clear sign of um, shadow banning. And I told him, no, that's just what the videos do, because we're in the news space. That's what they do. They are very popular and then they flatline. It's just normal. There's no no shadow banning there. But um, with you and with this case, also with the last two weeks, it's I just I, I it's too much to ask that we first have uh, Anthony Blinken, who actually singles out certain news media, Africa Stream in particular, as Russian disinformation, and then that gets taken down, and then other channels uh, in the geopolitics space who have been critical get taken down, including yours, including Rachel Blevis. Uh, it, this just seems like too too um, too concentrated to be a honest mistake. It's almost as if somebody had like created a list of of the of the ones we don't like and ones we don't want to speak anymore. And at the same time, we have this new slogan coming up. I, I'm not sure if it was Kamala Harris who used it, but I've heard, uh, I've heard this now once or twice. Freedom of speech is not freedom of reach. I'm like, oh, they're doing this. Um, and I don't know exactly who implements it. But the thing with YouTube, and we are experiencing that, is we don't know the rules. We have this stupid big fat rule book that, that's called terms and conditions that when something happens, they throw at us and then say, like, you figure it out yourself. You figure out where you went wrong. They never tell us with our videos what was the problem. Also with other issues, not just the hate speech. Yeah, and uh, well, this is the problem of this. Um, yeah, this new thing now, where they talk about the it's not a, the right of free speech; it's a responsibility. And uh, <laughs> if you're not uh, doing it correctly, they they might take it away from you. Uh, so it's uh, no, it's a very strange, strange time. Uh, but uh, sorry, no, no, no. It's it's this. Um, you know, this touches this touches us very personally because you know having a channel and 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 being able to communicate and having interviews 
and having also figured out how we do this with our daily lives, it, it kind of it becomes part of how we communicate. And um, it is it's also surprising to me how much it uh, scares me to think that uh, it really all this channel everything we do it's just a checkbox in an Excel spreadsheet of somebody. <laughs> it's kind of sad, yeah. isn't it? Yeah, and oh yeah, what, but what I wanted to say before as well was uh, you, you're very correct because as academics we should avoid this kind of speculation like am I shadow bandy if there's no evidence for it. So uh, so this is uh, yeah unless the, the the evidence is there one should be careful. But this makes it very difficult because the whole nature of these automated systems is that uh, there's no transparency. You don't know what's happening, who's being banned, why are they being banned. So. Uh, so on, on one hand there's no evidence and we shouldn't really speculate too much uh, but it, it is also but you can also then draw evidence from either directly what's happening now what the, the, the directions the tech companies are getting and and we are getting we, we see that they're getting directions they are uh, as we learned from uh, Mark Zuckerberg he said you know he was pressured by the US government to censor not just uh, COVID, uh, things which was correct information. He said uh, things that was satire and humor. They were pressured to censor all of it. And uh, he said he regretted bowing to pressure. He also admitted he, he, he engaged in what was effectively election interference when he when uh, Facebook and Twitter banned the Hunter Biden laptop story. As we remember, it came out. Um, and uh, they, you had some intelligence officials, uh, you know, from the Russia Gate uh, uh, time saying, "Well, this is probably Russian disinformation," and they took it and they banned it. Uh, so they, the New York Post, I think the oldest newspaper in the United States, it was taken off Twitter. Uh, it was impossible to share the story. So a complete lockdown on on information, intense censorship, and also normal media, by the way, they didn't, didn't want to publish on it because simply because they said it was. Russian disinformation and then later on it turns out well no it wasn't disinformation everything in the laptop was correct it was real and the Russians had absolutely nothing to do with it but this was a year later when the election was already over so so we know already that there's plenty of evidence that the, the, the digital platforms are being used uh, as instruments of power but but we also know the, therefore that the United States the, the government is pushing for this uh, again as I mentioned before with this uh, reports from the House of Representatives. They, they already did the research, they have the evidence. So, uh, and it can also be seen in the wider context of how the United States attempts now to dominate um, the, the, the information space uh, more coercively than they have in the past. So I mentioned in a recent article on Substack, you know, they took down, the, they hijacked the domain of Iranian media um, they, yeah, they outright banned Russian media and pushing it on other countries as well. They they financing billions of dollars into also smearing China in international media. Billions. Uh, this is something like covered very well by the Quincy Institute. This is, this yeah. is official no, this is money that, yeah. that, is, that is from Congress being given yeah. to you to discredit Russia, uh, uh, China. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, no, no, this is, this is not, again, this is why I'm saying it's not speculation, because this is in the open, this is evidence we have. And also, as you said, they banned the Africa stream, all they had to say is, ah, they're repeating Russian propaganda, boom, they're off. Uh, you see pressured censorship on Al Jazeera, openly by Blinken, uh, because, you know, they're taking in, in a harsh, too harsh view on Israel. And uh, TikTok, they're being pressured now to to be sold or banned. And we're also seeing around the world that countries are under greater pressure to conform to the censorship regime of the United States. So India, for example, uh, in their media, they points out that you know they have been able to withstand this pressure and they stand on their principles. But smaller countries, especially those who are allied to the United States, who are you know dependent, uh, very dependent, either economic or security, of course they're going to bow to Washington more and more. So. Uh, and but as you said, as you opened up this talk, uh, whenever you do some authoritarian moves, uh, push towards censorship and cancellations, and you know these bans, uh, it's always done in the name of compassion. You know, this we, we we care so much. This is you know we want to protect you from hate speech. We want to protect you from propaganda, and this is why we're now engaging in this uh, crude censorship. Yeah, but that's what makes it even worse because it becomes like accepted by the general public that this is for our own best. And, you know, the we can also look at other things which are stated openly by these platforms, right? On uh, on YouTube, we are not allowed to show videos how Palestinians get 
eradicated like 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 burned to death and die and how they're you know how how they're how they bleed out we cannot show that even if we had the media from from other sources because we these videos will get immediately banned because that's not safe that's not that's not good this is emotionally disturbing the the platforms tell us that the very things that are going wrong so horribly the most horrible of horrible things are not even allowed they're too they're too real, too graphic for for the big social media platforms. They're, thereby, they go away. So it is as if the not a, the, these these media platforms they try to create a sanitized version of reality, <laughs> um, and this is a huge problem because if more people understood just how incredibly horrible the dying is in Gaza, I mean, we would have much many more people on the streets. Yeah, but uh, it's yeah. So, so so as I said before, some things are accidental in algorithms, and some things are intentional. Like for example, the so-called um, uh, napalm girl, uh, folk something. Uh, you know, she when she was uh, I think nine years old or ten, she was uh, you know running away. It was in Vietnam, away from the Americans, who were just napalming her village. So she's running naked. This uh, this you know very iconic picture, which also contributed to shift the entire view of the Vietnam War. This was taken down, uh, a page was uh, removed or censored on uh, or Facebook or something because it was it fell under a child pornography because the girl was naked, burning her skin, burning from Nepal. So this, uh, I, I, I really doubt that the, this was intentional. So I do think you have some algorithms where they go wrong. But uh, I also yeah, obviously think that uh, the, um, there's some intention behind this because if if there's some gruesome picture of some uh, war crimes committed by a country we we are told to hate, uh, so be it you know the Russians, Chinese, or Iranians. Well, Chinese don't do many wars now, but uh, or <laughs> in the past uh, uh, forty years. But uh, let, let let's say there's uh, some war crimes committed by Russia. The more gruesome, the you know the more in, it's going to influence the public. I, I can't imagine uh, anyone. Uh, removing content to show uh, war crimes committed by the Russians, but uh, but when it goes the other way, uh, war crimes we might commit or our allies, then suddenly it's we're very careful about you know people's sensibility and uh, it's uh, yeah it's, uh, <laughs> it's, it's, it's I, I, I can't I can't help uh, I, th I think there's overwhelming evidence that there's obviously a correlation going on at least between. Um, who we're told to hate and like and what gets censored without going into speculation, of course. No, that, and, and that's a real danger, you know, and I, I caution everybody before before connecting dots where there are no connections, do give the benefit of the doubt um, because not everything is actually on is actually a plan or not everything is being is being executed in bad faith. But there are things <laughs> there are things that are executed in bad faith. And um, the the question to us is, of course, where societal mechanisms come to play, you know, where where it's like, let's say, an overprotectionist um, drive of these, in these institutions to keep themselves as profitable as possible, then starts to create censorship and, and where um, outside interference, political inf interference comes in. And we know, thanks to the Twitter files, we know, thanks to Elon Musk, that the, the political actors um, tried very blatantly to influence these um, community, um, what was it? Um, it? It's not called censorship bureau, it's called um, uh, the, 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 the political... Content moderation. Huh? Content moderation. Content moderation, thank you. Content moderation <laughs> is the Orwellian term for censorship, but to influence content moderation. And, you know, you understand where this comes from. I mean, these platforms actually could be used for mass spamming, right? Yeah. And then every single every, every single comment you read is just the, 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 the Ghanaian prince who wants to send you money, but you need to send $500 first, right? The, the spammers and the, the malicious intent is there by other actors as well. So you need a certain degree of, um, of some form of housekeeping. But the other side, <laughs> the, the, the people who want to influence the, the global narrative, they will also try to tap into that. And we need, it's very hard work to disentangle that, isn't it? Yeah, and it's, uh, it's, it's also, you can see it uh, through the prism of uh, the uh, technologists. There's an, 
Um, there's an interesting book. It's uh, called uh, Yeah, The Tower in the Square by uh, I forgot his name. Uh, but anyways, the, the whole a lot of the theme is um, about how communication technologies influence society. So, for example, in the past, there was when there was low literacy, you have no printing press. You know, who who, who could read the Bible? It's only a few. So the, the church kind of monopolized on information. So you then have the Catholic Church corruption. Uh, the power corrupts, and you see then that they begin to. Um, you know, call for, you know, give us money and uh, you will get through perjury and, uh, you know, we'll send you to heaven. And, uh, you know, so they begin to th uh, claim to be, yeah, this as ambassadors of God, uh, um, you know, to, to milk money from, from the believers. And then, uh, of course, you have, so there's too much concentration of power, but then you have the printing press. Now, everyone can have their own Bible. They can, they can have the personal relationship with God. They can read themselves. And then suddenly you see, um, the information being spread and uh, so so then you have the reformation you have now a different uh, interpretation of uh, christianity so you know we have uh, uh, massive wars uh, yeah, yeah europe is uh, slaughtered so you know so the information is no longer we no longer have the same information so then it's uh, it's too spread so it's either uh, you have a too too centralized in which it becomes very authoritarian or it becomes um, uh, too widespread and you not not lose control of the narrative uh, but we no longer for example read the same paper so uh, my, my, my point is in the early 90s when we talked about the internet i remember we were in school uh, it was uh, you know like a big uh, kumbaya experience so oh, now there won't be any more authoritarian governments because you can't control information anyone can say whatever they want online this was and then suddenly people became worried well what if they're uh, you know, there's, the gatekeepers are gone, but that's not always a bad thing. Uh, but then, uh, you know, they begin to talk about fake news and uh, uh, disinformation. So now kind of they reach the point where they're arguing, no, no, we need to concentrate, centralize power a bit. So now you see governments trying to assert control over the digital sphere where they, and the United States, uh, I think it dominates in, in this aspect in which they now, uh, which we learned yeah, through Snowden and everyone else that they're using all these digital plat tools instead of providing freedom to have mass authoritarian system, and so it's it's quite uh, yeah it's it's quite concerning. So uh, so it, I guess yeah also in one of my own books I also discuss this through the prism of of the actual available technologies because you want to find a way to not centralize uh, the communication power too much, but uh, also it's. Um, it's kind of important that we all read the same papers as it was or not yeah. the same, but uh, at least we talk, we don't live in completely opposite worlds. So. Yeah. So there, there is a societal interest in actually having some form of, of agreement of what's going on, right. Having, having some common denominator, there's a societal interest there. There's also societal interest in, in mechanisms to make sure that, uh, that what we can, the information we can access is accurate, right? And we see like different, different sectors of society try to do this in different ways. The newspapers have like uh, newsrooms and editors and so on, you know, a news story is not just one person's work. It goes through several people. They read each other, they do corrections, they put stuff in, in the hope that what comes out of it is better than what any single person can produce. We academics, we have a similar process with peer review, right? Because once you get your PhD, it's kind of understood that everybody is equal. So what do you do in order to improve? You just give it others to read and you get feedback and then you, you make changes. And what comes out of it should be better than what, what went into the process, right? And the idea here is to create quality um, and remove bias where it's not needed. Some bias is always a good thing because it is a perspective. Um, but... The problem is, of course, that these mechanisms can be abused and are being abused. And we've got these two, it seems to me now, in the digital sphere, like social media is under a different kind of censorship, a more kind of direct one uh, to, cer to a certain extent, whereas the, the published media is on the, a more sociological one, the Noam Chomsky-esque version of you know self-selection of people who then start par parroting each other and thereby create a unified a worldview and narrative um where do you see this going well like well this is the problem how do you strike a balance because i'm not sure if you saw recently john Kerry uh, gave a speech yeah. uh, and it was it's quite troubling because he essentially referred to first amendment that is in the united states the freedom of speech and uh, why this was a big problem uh, this effectively the first 
Amendo was the enemy because this allows people to say whatever they want on the internet. And, uh, it, you know, it, we need to stop wrong speech. And, you know, so, you know, it, it's, it's very dark when you listen to him. It's, it's a very scary thing to say. He calls the First but, Amendment literally a roadblock or just a block, yeah. a block in the way of, yeah. <laughs> of filtering it, information. <laughs> it makes it difficult to govern, he says. <laughs> and, uh, you know, at, at some point, I, I, at some level, I, I can understand if, if no one's, if we no longer live in the same reality because we're reading everything different, then of course I, I I can see why there's at the root of this there's a there's a there's some um, there's some truth. But the the problem then is uh, who uh, you know in in our society how do you come how do you decide what is truth? It's through open debate. That's why I'm so critical when people say propaganda. They use this word to shut down debate. But the way you overcome propaganda is you open up debate. So you have a competition of ideas and you expose the lies and you elevate the truth. So. Uh, and so instead, what he's suggesting is we effectively need what Orwell had wrote about a ministry of truth, like who decides what is truth. And we have, you know, we set up fact checkers. We have all these ways the government can try to establish itself as a ministry of truth uh, through third parties to seem less authoritarian. But at the end of the day, it's effectively the, 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 the government which uh, should decide what is real or not. And this is very concerning to me because over the past few years, we, we also see that they lie more and more. And part of this reason is there's, a, uh, there's this more competition now for uh, in, the inf in the information space. So it becomes even more corrupted. So keep in mind that the people who want to now tell us what is true these are the same people who said that you know trump was a russian agent um they said uh, uh you know they keep saying that trump called the neo-nazis you know fine people when you know the evidence there he didn't uh you know, had the uh, you know the hunter biden laptop the covid period my god how much uh, disinformation was uh, pushed by governments there yeah. Uh, but it's the, also you know, the, the same people who gave us weapons of mass destructions. It's the same people who gave us uh, incubator, uh, babies out of incubator stories for the first era. It's the people who gave us the uh, uh, the Gulf of Tonkin incident. I mean, this is a long, long history of blatant, yeah. proven lies, not just untruths, but lies, because they were they were put out into the world with a very clear intention behind them to achieve something uh, you have a steel dossier you remember the russian bounties on u.s soldiers uh, um you had the you know the, remember in war in, in the ukraine war you had the ghost of kiev everyone knew this was a fake story that one one uh, one fighter pilot, pilot among the ukrainians were just shooting down all these different uh like dozens of uh, russian flights it was uh, it was ridiculous but they're also telling us you know the, the russians blew up the dam they're attacking the kremlin they're attacking their own nuclear power plants uh it's uh, you know it's a uh, it's just uh yeah, the ivermectin story if you remember joe rogan <laughs> it, it's just lie longer. after lie after lie so this seems like a very strange point in time to tell the public listen there's a lot of disinformation out there trust us the government who you know who, who obviously pushing our own war narrative and our own stories uh which do not con coincide with truth so if you can't challenge the government what they say what do you have then you have a you can't have free speech anymore so it's uh but now they're effectively saying listen we're a democracy we believe in free speech that's why if you don't trust the government then you're attacking democracy essentially it's a very strange uh argument to make but it's 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 the same or it's it's the it's the same way of thinking as like the german government like thinking about whether or not to ban the afd you know ban a political party in the name of preserving democracy it's like it's this point where where the ideology starts biting its own tail right where we have this problem no no system no theory usually works completely coherent right it is there, there are always some contradictions in the system, but it is important to recognize the contradiction and uh, contradictions and make sure that that you find reasonable ways to uh, to deal with them. The problem we have now is that the that some part of this society in the West, the, the you know Europe and North America, are becoming extremely dogmatic. In fact, um, and less and less tolerant toward uh, toward just different ways of viewing the same thing yeah and um you know it's uh it can be referred to as the tyranny of uh 
of uh, morality or yeah, the tyranny of good intentions, which is well, whenever you frame any issue as a moral issue of a good, right versus wrong, all the complexity and nuance disappear. So I remember from in the 90s, we had the issue of, of immigration. Then, you know, you know, there's arguments why demographic changes, are, you know, can be positive, to, but also to revig revigorate in a population, but also it, it can create challenges. But it was essentially said, listen, either you're for it and you're good or you're against it and you're evil. So a, a lot of the challenges were not uh, addressed. And then you have the same with abortion, for example. Some people believe it's, uh, you know, you should uh, look after the, uh, life of uh, the unborn child but now if you say you you effectively hate uh, women uh, same with uh, the lgbt issues you know some people might be critical that uh, one is uh, yeah, promoting possible sexual content to children or even sterilizing children uh, you know this uh, this uh, yeah they, in the us they have, they've gone a bit further than they have in europe but there's a lot of criticism i'm not saying one is right necessarily one is wrong uh, of course i have my own opinions but but now in any criticism becomes hate and uh, you know you can't criticize anyone because that's hate so you're only allowed to have one perspective so we don't address the complexities so instead of resolving differences uh the the, the problems uh, you have uh, problems building up and i see the same in the foreign policy as well that is we uh, with uh, with with Russia now, for example, in the war in Ukraine, it's uh, everything is you know good versus evil, uh, right versus wrong. So yeah. all yeah. the nuance disappears. So if you try to say the basics, like listen, this uh, like we we obviously provoked Russia. We knew this would happen. We knew the uh, re pulling the re reluctant Ukrainians towards NATO would trigger a war, and we did it anyway. So uh, we knew that the, the Russians primarily wanted. Uh, uh, um, uh, restoring neutrality that this wasn't initially territorial conflict but but nonetheless we we, we keep we would then say well anything of this will legitimize russia or what it did so this is now seen as uh, supporting war and uh, just as a last point yesterday uh, so uh, ursula von der Leyen, she was making the same point because it was the 7th of october she was saying listen um one year ago on the 7th of october they uh, killed and uh and uh, kidnapped uh, all these people for one reason only because they're Jews, and and it's like God. I mean, I I I, don't, I think all all attacks on the civilian population uh, is is uh, can't be defended. Surely, yeah, of course they have a right to resist uh, occupation, but uh, it doesn't mean. But if you point out that the attack by Hamas it was if only hate of Jews, I mean. We can't mention the occupation. Uh, surely the the occupation was one of the factors. I would say the main factor for motivated the Hamas attack. You should be able to state this fact, but you can't because if you state it, then it's like, well, now you're justifying what happened, or uh, you are totally taking the side of Hamas against uh, the people who were kidnapped. I mean, th th this is absurd. You have to be able to talk about the nuances the, the complexities without but but you can't because everything is good versus evil one side is hate and justification and they have to be censored so this is kind of the direction we're going but that's what these war narratives do that's what these narratives to justify their side of violence do it's like you need to dumb down a very an obviously complex thing obviously 100 years old and obviously, already tens of thousands of people have been dying in this in in this in this horrible conflict, right? And it is it is I mean it's it it's just so insulting to the intellect that then elected or unelected leaders. I mean, depends on how you look at it. There is an argument to make that. I mean, obviously, Ursula von der Leyen sits there in. In, in conformity with all the rules and, and so on, but nobody ever voted for her for her office. But anyhow, that these people who sit there then feed us with this dumb version of reality, an utterly dumb version. And I cannot believe that she is that dumb. I refuse to believe that because uh, I don't like her, but I don't think that somebody can have gone through that much schooling and that and that long a process and be that good at politics on the highest level and be that stupid to believe in that narrative, which means that it is deployed with intention and that this is rehearsed and that there's a team that 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 coaches people on like these. How do you speak about this? Um, yeah, but but this is why when whenever this is kind of war propaganda one hundred and one, you want to frame 
who was opposition to the war as effectively being being treason and this is uh, uh, why if you criticize uh, Israel's uh, war you you will be called anti-semite but uh, but you know this is also is so vile because it also ignores reality which is that uh, a lot of the main groups in the United States who are fighting or pushing against the uh, uh, you know, supporting the genocide. They're, they're, they're Jewish groups, they're Jewish activists, they're Jewish intellectuals. And, uh, you know, they also during, uh, you know, with the invasion of Iraq, which was also very much uh, favored by Israel and pushed by the Israeli lobby, uh, you saw that uh, in America, uh, Jews or Jewish people were more likely to oppose the invasion of Iraq than, than others. So, 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 so this idea that you know, if you don't agree with our policy, you hate the Jews. It's just it, it's intended to only uh, slander, and it's just, again the same with the the war in uh, in Ukraine now. The, the the idea that if you call for listen, we, this is uh, obviously provoked this NATO expansion. Then, well, then you're taking Russia's side. You're 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 yeah. supporting the, mil- the killing. And for me, it's personally it, it makes the blood boil because for more than a decade. Uh, even back from 2013 at the end, I remember I was uh, speaking at uh, my university in Sydney and I was making the point that this is a disaster. We're going to start a war if we're pushing, because it was obvious we're pushing for regime change in, in Ukraine. This can only result in war. So for more than a decade, I was arguing we, we can't do this, only, not just an, from an academic perspective, as this is my research focus, but I, I always known for the past 25 years, um, you know, so many Ukrainian and Russian friends to... It's horrible to see them, you know, slaughtering each other in the tens of thousands. And yet, then these people, when you criticize, you know, provoking a war, they then turn it on you saying, no, 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 you are supporting this. You're backing it. It's, it's so vile. But this is yeah. what you always do in every war. Same as Iraq war. Oh, sorry, just la, la, last point. That was, uh, who was there? Applebaum, who, when the Europeans opposed the Iraq war, she actually wrote a headline article going uh, in the headline was uh, uh, the freedom haters. So because the Europeans didn't support the invasion of Iraq, which led to the death of hundreds of thousands of civilians, you hated freedom. I mean, this is what you do. This is war propaganda. It's just uh, yeah, disgusting at every level. It is. It is. But it, in a way, what then is also so insulting is that this narrative is the demand to accept a stupid version of reality. And so <laughs> the, the ultimate act of this being a dissident is like to refuse to be stupid. I am not going to be dumbed down to that goddamn level. <laughs> I am going to be, I'm going to work on the complexities and I'm going to try to understand what's behind it. Um, and th- this brings me to my last point. What do we do next, Glenn? Like people ask, like, what do we do? I mean, we know that these platforms are not safe. We know that we're just a checkbox in a, in a, in a spreadsheet. Uh, we have different platforms, and I but I just checked them out. I mean, Substack headquarters San Francisco, Patreon head, headquarters San Francisco, <laughs> and you know the problem is the Chinese are also not much better at free speech. I tried to upload my videos on Bilibili, they got immediately deleted, uh, oh. and the Russians are not famous for free speech either. Uh, but although I have never tried there, uh, but the problem is that large states with digital sovereignty. I wouldn't trust any one of them to actually allow speech that's not in their favor. So what do we do? I, <laughs> I wish I had a good answer uh, for, for this, but uh, it's, uh, uh, yeah, uh, the, I, I, I also have a, a Rutube and BitChute and all, but, but they're quite good because you can just transfer video automatically across, it syncs it, so you don't have to put any work uh, into it. But uh, But also, Different countries will differ, uh, censor different things. So if you, <laughs> so it might survive somewhere, uh, but but also it might not uh, help you uh, that much because of course now it's uh, the United States that puts massive pressure over its digital platforms, and you would assume that market forces would punish this by making uh, this uh, these platforms uh, less uh, less attractive because if you keep censoring people will go other places but uh, there's still an effort to to suffocate because uh, when when twitter and facebook uh, began their growing uh, censorship was it about uh, what was it, six seven years ago you know you had all these people migrating towards parlor 
uh, as this alternative social media platform. But then uh, Apple and Google, they suspended the app from their platforms and then Amazon expelled them from their servers. So they just knocked out the whole platform. They took it out, essentially saying they can only be us. And, uh, you know, we, we, we take, because, and, and that was approved because they're taking orders from, from the US government. And look at then Elon Musk, you know, he's, it's a bit sad that an oligarch has to come to the rescue like Batman to save freedom of speech. But then he's like a, a you know oligarch who wants to have freedom of speech at least in the areas he cares about. And then um, and then you have uh, and more more pressure now. You have uh, all this uh, push for you know people in the media calling for arresting him, uh, taking over Twitter. They're calling a far right platform because they're not uh, censoring. And the EU, you know, is Elon Musk was going to have an interview with. Uh, he did have an interview with um, Donald Trump, but before the interview even happened, you had the EU censorship czar, uh, Breton, who who then sent a letter to Elon Musk telling him not to post this interview. The, it was a live interview because of possible hate speech. So it was a uh, pre-crime, you know, before the... <laughs> Before the harmful content and the hate speech had even had even occurred, uh, this is when uh, when it happened. And you you know look at the rest of uh, you know so people then come to the United States, so they go abroad. But uh, you know the United States, they were willing to arrest. If you remember, one of the was a CEO of a Huawei. That wasn't social media though. But they also now in France arrested uh, Pavel Durov of Telegram. You know, I'm not sure if they got a backdoor channel through this arrest. But but anyways, there there there's a preparedness to take huge steps to control this new digital space. And uh, mm. last, I'm just, I think maybe we can work towards making it less normalized because it didn't censorship didn't used to be this normalized and. Uh, and it's worth going back. I always go back to Alex Jones because you know he was the first one to be censored, if you remember. And um, yeah, and uh, yeah. but but then back. But this is how you normalize it. No one really wanted to post it because you know he's quite vile. You know he was he was calling the parents of the kids uh, who were slaughtered in uh, Sandy Hook. He called their parents for actors who were paid because it was all a conspiracy theory. So it was kind of free speech at its worst. Uh, just uh, yeah, actual hate speech, like very, very uh, yeah, awful. So this was like the perfect case. No one would oppose. So they deplatformed him, a new word which entered the vocabulary. And they, and uh, and then people assumed, well, I guess it was an exception, but instead it was the precedent which they would build on. So keep in mind, they even deplatformed the president of the United States, Donald Trump, while he was still president. Uh, was it in the early January 2020? So it's uh, so now it's become normalized. Now we talk about, oh yeah, all, all these people left and right being canceled, uh, the, the platforms being taken down, no evidence required. So see how quickly this normalized because Alex Jones, they took him down in 2018 and slowly this has become this incrementalism. They have made it just more and more uh, normal to the point where people, all, not, not, not almost, they do see it as moral uh, that, well, if you're not censoring, now you're permitting hate. So so the people who are not permitting hate. They are the bad guys. They are right wing, and the, the, the people who are sorry doing content moderation, they are moral. So the whole sacred principle we had of uh, free speech it's uh, thrown out the window. It's uh, yeah, quite quite remarkable. So I'm not sure what to do. Uh, don't normalize it at least. No, don't normalize it, and also think about um, ways out. I mean, there's several there's several layers, right? There's the the laws that we would want in place or not want in place in order to protect us on a national level. Then there's the there's the the the, te- the companies we would like to exist or not exist, and the technology that we would like to have or not have. And you know, some good technology can go a long way. Just think about the importance of that one singular site, Library Genesis. For us academics and library genesis allows us to circumvent basically uh, uh, these these ridiculous uh, um, copyright of, of, of books where we can download books massively and it's really really important for academia actually um, especially in the humanities and a good piece of tech even just by a small group can go a long way but um, the, it needs to interact somehow with the with the with the uh, environment we are living in, and ideally we would want to have states banding together and making a treaty or something like that on the UN level on the free on the freedom of speech or freedom of platforms, and try to push this back this um, 
this dystopian uh, uh, um, environment that that certain parts of certain states want to push us in. But um, yeah, so but at least uh, migrate towards the platforms which uh, don't do political. Yeah. Like uh, you know, everyone will do some uh, content moderation. It seems, but uh, where it's not obviously used for. Uh, for 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 politics, I think that is a very important. And overall, the the principle of censorship and and pro it has to be rejected because. And keep in mind, it always comes delivered, as I say, through through compassion. So the fighting hate or propaganda, but but it, but it's important to take a uh, just take a principled stand because I'm not only having problem with the digital platforms, but uh, even when I write articles, because I write articles, I publish them on my Substack, which is. Only, only it's mine. But whenever I'm contacted by any media, be it Brazilian or Irish or Russian, and they say, "Can we take one?" I say, "Yeah, sure. You don't need to ask my permission. You can just take a copy anything you want and publish it, uh, republish. You know, I don't take a fee or anything. Just take what you want, and uh, and they do. And uh, then I'm contacted by you know the 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 virtuous journalists in my country who then, well, how can you? you know have it published in uh, like rt this is a russian propaganda the americans have told us so uh, you know now you're participating but but i don't understand the logic i put publish it in my sub stack they don't even have to ask me they, they they publish it in russian media and now suddenly magically it became propaganda i don't think these people know what propaganda actually means uh how it magically became <laughs> propaganda in this process so i uh, so I, I I don't I don't want to make any apologies for it because they try to make me explain myself why I'm not censoring engaging in self censorship and I say listen I, I I'm old enough to remember when censorship was a bad thing and they're doing all they can to make a moral case for censorship but I I just say no I'm not interested I'm not part of this uh, so surely if there's a law I have to conform to the law but unless there's a law which forces me to do so. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna play ball, and I'm not uh, gonna engage in any voluntarily self censorship. So I think it's just a. Uh, it causes a lot of trouble. Uh, but, you know, if you Google my name, it's, it's at least in my own country, they have uh, yeah made me into a Russian propagandist, and uh, no no Norwegian journalist wants to approach me for anything. But that's okay. At least you know, it, it's. Uh, <laughs> You should be able to stand for something. I think the censorship is gonna really. We're gonna regret this very much. We are, and you know, if if our channels and this community that we that we build proves one thing is that there's enough people who th who see through the BS, and actually, you know, there's people are smart. <laughs> A lot of people are quite intelligent, and and are really able to discern levels and so on, and 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 think critically, and they will discard some of the things you say because they they don't agree with it, which is fine, and then they will agree with other parts, which is exactly what we should do. We're adults. We can actually deal with information. Um, so, uh, Glenn, I am just very, very happy that you're back on YouTube I, because it is, it's is—it's a glimmer of hope that maybe the world is not as dark as we see it. Maybe, maybe this was a mistake. And like others too, maybe it's a glitch in YouTube. Uh, let's hope it is because I would really like to see an open society further flourishing in order for us to have these conversations. Thank you very much for your time today. And I'll see you here again. And I see you on your channel, uh, Glenn Deason on YouTube. Uh, anywhere else you want people to go? Oh, I've, I have too many. <laughs> now I think I'm on uh, yeah, Spotify. So, Substack is my main one now, actually, because I, I, I'm i going a bit more into writing articles. But otherwise, I'm on, uh, uh, yeah. Uh, X. It shoot rumble X, yeah. So I'm, I'm, I've, I've got many of them. Uh, I'm also Billy, Billy the Chinese, uh, Rutube the Russian. So, but my main one is Substack and uh, Rumble now. Uh, you'll still get my, yeah, um, yeah. So, so the, this will be the two ones. Uh, sorry, X, Rumble, and uh, Substack. So, yeah, please do follow and, uh, yeah, <laughs> so don't normalize uh, censorship. Wonderful words, Glenn Deason. We'll talk soon again. Thank you, Pascal.